Welcome back to our series on being Presbyterian. Uh, Today we are talking about church government. That's one of those practices that make up Presbyterian identity. You remember we have been talking about Presbyterian identity under this kind of threefold rubric, this idea that beliefs, practices, and stories, when they come together, they shape fundamentally our sense of identity. That's true for us personally, in terms of personal identity, but it's also true for us religiously, denominationally, when it comes to Presbyterian identity. So we've been talking about particular beliefs. We've talked about the idea that God is king, that he is sovereign over all things, and he is king because he is the creator. He made everything. He rules over all things in his providence. And if he's king over creation and over providence, he certainly is king in matters of salvation. And because God is king in matters of salvation, it's his grace that moves towards us, the priority then of amazing grace. And remember, we looked at Ephesians 2 uh, and unpacked how uh, our desperate need, we were totally depraved, not as bad as we could be, but, but bad through and through because of our tremendous need. We couldn't save ourselves. God had to rescue us. And he did so motivated by his undeserved favor towards us. We talked about the key Presbyterian belief in terms of how to read the Bible, in terms of covenant kingdom, uh, that the Bible is an unfolding story of redemption, a covenant story of redemption. And remember, we talked about the bow tie and showed how the Old Testament narrowed to Jesus Christ by way of promise and then exploded out to encompass the uttermost parts of the world as Jesus, the forever king ruling over a forever kingdom, uh, was calling the nations to himself. And then finally, we talked about the nature of the church, and as part of that, uh, the nature of the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and tried to answer the question, why is it we baptize babies? Uh, We talked then about these Presbyterian beliefs, these core understandings that shape who I am and what I do, But then last week, we started talking about practices that flowed from those beliefs. And one practice uh, is the practice of worship. Uh, And so we talked about how God's Word regulates our worship, how worship is covenant renewal. There is a mutuality in our worship, uh, a dialogue, if you will, that goes on between God who initiates in His grace, His movement towards us, and our response and then how worship is the representation and reapplication of the gospel. And I walked us through a, a worship service at IPC, a Sunday morning worship service, and tried to show you how those three undergirders or sidelines or uh, supports worked out in shaping Reformed worship here at our church. But today we, we talk about this practice of, of church government, of, of church polity. And it, it's striking that denominations tend to name themselves after what's important to them. Baptists, for example. Baptists uh, name themselves after a particular stance, a particular commitment to baptism, and particularly believers' baptism by the mode of immersion, and hence they're known as as Baptists. Methodists, uh, they got their name back in the 1720s when John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield were at Oxford as a little holy club, and as they uh, uh, tried to discipline their lives for holiness, the, their opponents said they were, they were pursuing a method. They weren't pursuing God, and it stuck. They became Methodists. Lutherans. Uh, Lutherans are, are known for uh, not just the solas, but particularly emphasizing uh, the teaching of Martin Luther as a, almost a latter-day prophet of sorts. And so uh, within, Meth- uh, within Lutheranism throughout its history, the question has been, what did Luther say and how close are you to it? Hence, they're known as, as Lutherans. But, but we are Presbyterians, uh, which means that we are uh, shaped by a particular way of thinking about church government. Our very name has it in its title, the word presbyter, which is in the word Presbyterian, is actually the Greek word from which we get our English word elder. Uh, And so for us, for Presbyterians, we are particularly known for uh, being those who emphasize that Jesus rules his church through elders. Now, 
as the title of this talk also indicates, we're also known for having this little bit of DNA in us, and written on that DNA is decently and in order. <laughs> and so because of 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done decently and in order, that, that's kind of become a Presbyterian motto of sorts, but, but for good reason because of these prior beliefs that we've talked about, and especially the fact that God is sovereign, that God is king. How does God rule over his church? How does he exercise his authority over us as his followers? Well, he does so through King Jesus. King Jesus then mediates that authority through elders. So this is actually a, a very significant belief that shapes us as, and practice that shapes us as, as Presbyterians. Now, when we say those words, Jesus rules his church, that word rule has the idea of, of authority or of power. Now, of course, it's spiritual power, right? It's is not coercive power that would belong to the state. You know, the church's authority, the church's power it's spiritual it's ministerial it's declarative but still there is authority when we talk about jesus ruling over his church and and when you talk about authority or when you talk about power inevitably there are misconceptions or potential errors that people might fall into uh, you can talk about them almost on two poles if you will one pole would be the the roman catholic pole the idea that the church's authority is such that to, to hear the church's voice is to hear Christ's own voice. And no dissent from that is possible. So when the Pope speaks from the chair, ex cathedra, as the vicar of Christ, as the substitute for Christ, when he speaks, he speaks with Christ's voice and Christ's authority. And so as the church argued in the late 19th century, the Pope does so infallibly without the possibility of error. His, his pronouncements are trustworthy because they are Christ's own proclamations. Well, anyone who knows anything about church history knows that, that there have been countless times when the Pope has spoken from the chair and been profoundly in error. Not to mention the fact that, that at one point in the 14th century, there wasn't just one pope, there was three popes. There was a pope based in, in the Vatican, there was a pope based in Avignon, France, and there was a third pope who had been called by a council trying to displace the other two popes and reestablish the papacy in him. So which pope was the vicar of Christ? And which pope had authority to speak infallibly? Well, of course, you can kind of see the nonsense we get ourselves into when we have any human being who's fallible claim infallible authority. But there's, a, there's another pull, that, another potential error that we can slip into, and it would be what I would call a congregationalist or even an evangelical, broadly evangelical error, which is that the church has no legitimate authority over the lives of Christians, save that which is granted to to them by believers themselves. I, I, I call this the, the social contract approach to church authority. You remember the social contract. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, the great 18th century political theorist, argued that, that, that politically speaking, human beings, individuals, have authority, all authority for their lives, rooted in themselves. But in order to exist in society, in order to create a state, we have to give up some of our authority to the state in a social contract in order to have certain services provided for us. For example, police state and justice and other things. And so, so we give some of our authority up, but, but we can always take it back, and that would be then revolution. We'll apply that to the church, and some people think that, well, I, I have all authority. It's just me and Jesus. In fact, uh, because of the teaching of soul liberty uh, and the priesthood of the believers, I am myself a priest and I have all liberty and authority. Jesus is Lord of my conscience alone. And so I'm not going to, to submit to anybody save those to whom I cede authority in a kind of social contract. Because I can't obviously preach God's word to myself or administer the sacraments to myself or do certain other things. So I give up some authority, 
but really the church doesn't have authority over me. Well, we can see some of the problems that that way of thinking might lead us towards. There was the Baptist historian Winthrop Hudson who, uh, in a veiled criticism, somewhat humorous of his own tradition, said that part of the problem of Baptists is that every man's hat is his own church. Uh, Nobody but Jesus can tell me what to do becomes very problematic uh, over the long run. And two, the, the Bible itself doesn't teach us to expect either of those poles, either the Roman Catholic pole or uh, the Congregationalist or Evangelical poll. Uh, because what the Bible teaches us to expect is that Jesus himself rules over his church. But just think about it. Every society, every organization, not just a church, but any society, any organization, if it's going to do something, is going to have two characteristics common to it. Whether it's a small business, whether it's a civic organization, whether it's a nonprofit, whether it's a church, every organization that's trying to do something has two characteristics that are common to it. One is officers, and the other is laws. Every organization in society, if it's going to do something, has to have officers. Even a group of six will pick a convener or a leader who will execute and represent the group uh, and do its work. Um, If you don't have someone who's a chairperson or a president or a convener, then the group is a mob, and it won't accomplish anything, not of purpose. So every organization, every society has to have officers and has to have laws. And those laws are necessary to guide the group to do its work. Uh, These laws provide warrants and organizational structure for the group. We often think of those in terms of, of bylaws. So whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a civic organization, certainly if you're a business, uh, a church, uh, you, have, you have bylaws that guide and direct the work of the whole. If you don't have, if you don't have laws that direct you, um, you're just going to wander aimlessly around. Well, well, both of those things are true when you talk about a church. A church has officers, a church has laws. And when you talk about officers and laws, that means then there must be power or authority within the organization, and then ultimately given to those officers to act on behalf of the group, to actually accomplish something. The group has inherent in itself power and authority to act. And and that's what we're trying to say when we talk about the church then. The church as a society of those who believe in Jesus Christ has power or authority to do certain things. And we would say as Presbyterians, the church as a society of those who follow Jesus has authority given to it by Christ to do three things in particular. Three. Three things in particular. To declare its doctrine, to order its worship, and to discipline its members. To declare its doctrine, to order its worship, and to discipline its members. Beyond that, it has authority to select its own officers and to develop its own laws agreeable to Scripture. But don't miss it. When you think about what does the church have authority to do, it has authority to declare its doctrine, to order its worship, and to discipline its members. And so so it's limited in some degree. It's not like in the Roman Catholic position where the Pope can declare from the chair on all sorts of matters with the voice of Christ. Nor is it uh, similar to the Congregationalist or Evangelical model where really you don't have much authority to tell me much of anything to do. Uh, And if I don't like what's going on, I'm going to leave. No, the church has authority given to it by Jesus to declare its doctrine, order its worship, and discipline its members. Now, now what is the source of that authority? Who Who is the source of that authority? Well, it's Jesus. Jesus is is king over his church. Uh, One of the the 17th century slogans from our Presbyterian forefathers, the Scottish Covenanters, uh, declared for Christ, crown and covenant. Uh, They were particularly rebelling against the Church of England's claim that the King of England was king over the church. And as England was trying to enforce its form of church government upon Scotland, and hence 
usurp the crown rights of Jesus over his church and place the king of England over the Christians in Scotland, the Covenanters rebelled against that. And they said, no, no, it's Christ's crown. It's his covenant. He's king over his church. My friend George Robertson, with whom I served in St. Louis and now have the pleasure of serving in Memphis beside him as he's now pastor at Second Presbyterian Church, uh, his twin daughters are my oldest son's same age, uh, but right before we got to St. Louis to serve with George and his family at Covenant Church in St. Louis, uh, there was a vacation Bible school at Covenant Church, uh, and the theme of the, the vacation Bible school was Jesus is king over all sorts of things, but particularly on this particular day, he was king over the church. The, the craft for the little kids, remember those, those Burger King crowns? Uh, well, the, the teacher had these Burger King crowns, and, and they were bedazzling them with all sorts of bling to make them beautiful. And then a uh, good VBS teacher, she took the craft, and she said, all right, kids, now, now who wears a crown? And the kids all shouted out, a king! Uh, and then she said, that's right, now who's king of the church? And one of the twins raised their hands, and she said, my daddy's king of the church. Well, no, um, no pastor, no elder, uh, no wealthy donor is king of the church. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is king of the church. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. That's why we are able to go and make disciples. Jesus has given out of his own authority, authority to us to do what? To teach, to declare doctrine, to baptize to order uh, worship, and ultimately to discipline, to teach them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. So, so Jesus, who has all authority, has given that authority to us to do what? To declare doctrine, to order worship, to discipline members. Of course, Ephesians tells us, too, that Jesus is head over all things for the church, so Jesus is not only king of the church, he's also king of his world, but he's king over his world for the church. Paul says in Ephesians 1.22, and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So did you hear it? Jesus is, has been given as head over all things to the church. And so he's Lord over the church. He's Lord over each individual in the church, but he's Lord over the church collectively so that, as Paul says in Romans 14, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. He's king. So he's the source of church authority or church power. But what are the laws of church power? Where do we find them? Well, just as we saw with, with worship, worship is regulated by God's word, so it is with church government. The laws of church government are found in the pages of Holy Scripture. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes this letter towards the end of his ministry as he's looking to the time when the apostles will move off the scene. And he says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. So he wrote the pastoral epistles so that we would know how we should live in the context of the church. And right before that section in 1 Timothy 3, what did Paul talk about? That's right, elders and deacons. He talked about church government. He talked about how we should be ordered as a church. The will of Christ expressed in Holy Scripture is his, is his law. And so when we come to think about how we are to act as a church uh, in terms of church government, we turn to the pages of Holy Scripture. Now, now, there's an important distinction that we talked about when we talked about worship, and it applies here. Uh, when we talk about church government. The Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 1 talked about how Scripture reveals elements of both worship and government, but then leaves the circumstances of applying uh, or working out 
some aspects of worship and church government to common sense. And that's where we get that distinction, remember, between elements and circumstances. Elements are those things revealed in Scripture uh, that must exist, without which, when it comes to church government, there would be no church. Um, Things like uh, the offices of elder and deacon. Things like um, the connectional nature of the church, uh, expressed particularly in the idea of presbytery. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Things like that the church has authority to declare its doctrine, order its worship, and discipline its members. And then particularly when we talk about discipline, Matthew 18 and how discipline is to be unfolded. Uh, those things are, are revealed. Those are elements of church government. Those are the things in church government that must exist, that must happen, without which there is no church. But, but talking about these elements, it's not intuitively obvious. How do you elect elders? How do you choose deacons? How do you go about running a presbytery? How do you actually do discipline? What are the things uh, when it comes to declaring doctrine? How do you form a confession of faith? How do you amend it? None of those things are obvious. And so there there are circumstances, those things that are necessary for church government to happen, Uh, that are open to common sense and local circumstance, those circumstances uh, allow us to to work out how to actually perform those elements. In the PCA, um, our denomination, the way we work out those circumstances uh, and codify them is in our Book of Church order. Uh, Now, uh, the Book of Church order has all kinds of helpful information in here. It makes exciting reading. Uh, I'm sure that if you wanted to, to, uh, to, to gain some great insight and maybe even help you fall asleep, you want to keep a copy of the Book of Church Order on your bedside reading table um, so that you might be able to fall asleep each night. But, but seriously, when it comes to thinking about discipline, for example, um, you have Matthew 18, but there's, there's a number of, of pieces that are not given to us in Matthew 18. How do you actually work the process when someone doesn't listen to the church? Is there a process that's necessary to actually excommunicate someone? What are, what are the rules of discipline? Well, in the PCA, we've worked that out in some detail in chapters 27 to 46 in our Book of Church Order. Or declaring doctrine. What is the relationship between our confession of faith and Scripture? How do we use the confession of faith when it comes to discipline? How do you amend the confession of faith? Because we know that, that being human, we can err in summarizing the Scripture. So is there a process for amending the confession of faith, the Westminster Standards? Well, yes, all of that is contained, the process is contained in the Book of Church Order. And it's, and it's appropriate in working out these circumstances as we try to live out this exercise of church authority. We believe that that the laws of church authority are are given to us in Scripture, these elements given to us in Scripture, but how to work them out moment by moment in real life, that's open to common sense, and we summarize that in our Book of Church Order. Of course, you, you have laws with an organization or society, but you also have officers. So Christ doesn't exercise his authority authority immediately, that is, without mediation. Now, he exercises his authority mediately, that is, through mediation, through officers. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 7, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, that, that officers are, in fact, gifts of Christ to his church. And he says in chapter 4, verse 7, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. And then after the parenthesis, he tells you what those gifts are. Uh, is it the pouring out of the Holy Spirit? Is it the sign gifts? What are the gifts? Well, here's the gift. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers 
to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So when, when Christ ascended on high and he gained gifts from the Father uh, to give to his church, what did he give? Well, he gave officers. He gave elders and deacons, pastors, teachers, those who would shepherd God's people and equip them for the work of ministry. Now, now that doesn't mean that officers, that elders and deacons should walk around the church with their thumbs in their lapel saying, ha, 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 I'm a gift to the church. Look at me. You better pay attention to me because I'm Christ's gift. Now, that would be a bit much. But, but truth be told, not many of us are prone to that kind of attitude. Far more of us look at ourselves and our sin and our difficulties and our struggles, particularly when we're dealing with some messy matter, and we say, how in the world can I even speak to this? How in the world can I even intervene in this? I'm, I'm no better than this person. I'm prone to the same sins, the same struggles. How, how can I even do this? And it's, it's at that moment that we need to hear the Apostle Paul's voice under the inspiration of, whole, of the Holy Spirit saying to us, no, wait, you're Christ's gift. Christ has placed you here to shepherd these people, to oversee them, to involve yourself in their lives, to pastor them. You, you, you can't run away because Christ gave you as his gift to the church. In fact, it's, it's through officers whom Christ is, has given as his gift and through his word, which he's given as his law, that Christ rules over his church. Now, how does Christ do that? How does Christ give officers to the church to mediate his authority? Well, in the different systems of church government, uh, there are different approaches to that. There are three big approaches or main approaches. Uh, the Episcopal uh, or the prelactical, episcopal ha- co- it comes from a Greek word, episkopos, that has the, uh, translates as bishop. Uh, you have the congregational, uh, and then the happy meeting, the Presbyterians. In an episcopal setting, Christ chooses bishops as his gift and gives authority to the bishop and mediates that authority through the bishop to the congregation. So the bishop is the one that has authority in the, presby- in the, uh, in the Episcopal setup. Uh, Christ gives that authority to the bishop and then the bishop exercises Christ's authority over the congregation. So that in Episcopals, uh, in Episcopalianism, for example, Um, You need a bishop to be present in order to be confirmed or to be ordained uh, or to carry on a range of other activities in the life of the church because he is the one that has Christ's authority to act on Christ's behalf. In congregationalism, Christ gives his authority directly to the congregation And then the congregation selects deacons, particularly in Baptist setting, um, Baptist setting, uh, who carry out certain functions. But really, the congregation maintains and retains the authority that Christ has given to it. So, for example, in one Baptist church where I was a member many years ago, uh, we 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 had every Wednesday night had a Wednesday night business meeting. We'd have dinner, and then we'd go in the sanctuary, we'd have business meetings. Now, this was a large church, uh, a church that was almost as large as, as IPC here in Memphis. Um, but, but we voted on every expenditure over $500, uh, approved it in some way. We received members whom we never met. We disciplined members about whom we knew nothing. Um, why did we do that? It was because Christ gave that authority to the congregation. Uh, And they didn't cede that authority to deacons or pastors. No, the congregation exercises Christ's authority in accordance with Christ's laws. So in Episcopalianism, uh, Christ's authority is mediated top-down. In congregational structures, it's mediated, if you will, bottom-up from the congregation. In Presbyterianism, 
it, it actually moves in, in two directions. Uh, Christ in Presbyterianism gives that authority, his authority, all authority in heaven and earth given to me, he gives that authority to the congregation to do one big particular thing, which is to select elders. And these elders are representatives of the people who act on behalf of the congregation. But, but it's not that simple. Remember what I said about Christ giving officers his gift to his church? Christ is actually the one active in the congregation's selection of elders so that when, when congregations nominate and elect elders, Christ is concurrently giving those elders to the church. Remember back when we were talking about the sovereignty of God and we, we talked about the word concurrence? There's a concurrence between God's uh, desires and purposes in, in, in a particular event and ours. And that's why Joseph could say, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good, the same event. Well, well there was this idea of concurrence there, that, that, that there could be multiple purposes in the same event. So it is in the selection of officers. Yes, we look among ourselves, we see who's godly among us, we see who matches the standard of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. We nominate them, they're trained, they're elected, but there's a concurrence so that when the congregation selects their elders, Christ is the one selecting them too. And he mediates his authority through these elders that the congregation has selected. So you see, Top-down for Episcopalians, bottom-up for Congregationalists, both ways. It, there's a movement from Christ and the people in the selection of, of, of elders. And that's how Christ exercises his authority and chooses these elders. Now, just very briefly, uh, we're going to get just a little bit further in the weeds on church authority and, and the kind of authority that elders exercise there's a distinction that we make that you'll actually find in our Book of Church order that has always proven very helpful for me. And when I've explained it to others, um, they found it helpful to understand this as well. We make a distinction when we talk about the authority or the power that elders exercise between the power of order and the power of jurisdiction. Now, the power of order... Uh, is exercised by officers individually through a grant of authority through a session or congregation's call and by a presbyter presbytery's authorization. Uh, particularly, uh, when we talk about the power to order, we're talking about the power especially to order worship. That can be done, to order worship can be done individually by a, an elder because a congregation or a session has called that person to do it and the presbytery has agreed. So, for example, I, I'm responsible, part of my responsibilities is I'm responsible for planning our worship services here at IPC. And more times than not, I'm the one who's also presiding. But I, I didn't have that authority simply because I went to seminary or because I'm good at it. I, you know, it wasn't as though I showed up at IPC one day and said, hey, y'all, I know you're without a senior pastor. I've got some experience doing this. Just let me step in, and I can fill the gap for you, and we'll have some really inspirational, exciting worship services. No, it didn't work that way. Uh, what actually happened was the congregation called me, uh, and remember, when the congregation calls, that's also Christ's call, and then the presbytery actually put me here. There was a larger group uh, responsible for placing me, installing me here, and giving me the authority to actually order the worship services. So technically speaking, our worship services here are overseen not just by our session, but also by our presbytery, who's responsible for me being here. Now, I don't know about you, but that gives me as a, a congregant great comfort to know that, that the man who is responsible, the elder who's responsible for planning the worship service, isn't just some guy who wandered in off the street with no theological training, no vetting, and is just placed in this responsibility. No, there was a number of folks who vetted the individual who is presiding at this worship service. And so 
And so we have some measure of, of confidence that if, if something goes wrong, there's someone somewhere who will check in. Um, there's been a grant of authority to order worship, but that's always a delegated authority that, that's ultimately held by other bodies. So, so there's a power to order, but there's also a power of jurisdiction. And this is exercised by officers jointly as a church court. And, and we think of that particularly in terms of declaring doctrine and in terms of doing discipline. So I'm not allowed to declare my own doctrine as a minister. Um, I subscribe to the Westminster Standards of Faith. That's, uh, that's part of my ordination vows. Um, but if I have a difference with the Westminster Standards, um, I'm not allowed to just kind of go out and say, you know what, Westminster Standards on this point, it's bunk, don't need to pay attention to it, forget about it, listen to what I say. No, I'm, I'm not al really allowed to do that. I don't have that authority or power to do that. Any differences that I might have with the Westminster Standards have actually been put under the jurisdiction of other officers acting as a church court who have ruled whether the difference is substantial or only semantic. Um, again, that's, that's really important because Christ has given the church authority to do what? To declare its doctrine, order its worship, discipline its members. And the idea that we declare doctrine collectively as Christ's church is really, really important. It keeps us from going off on our own hobby horses. It keeps us centered on what God's Word actually says. Uh, it protects the church, its purity, its peace, its unity. But it's, it's also the case that jurisdiction, this power of jurisdiction, exercised jointly as a church court, it's important that it's also exercised jointly when it comes to church discipline. I don't have authority as an elder to go up to someone and to say, as an, as an elder in Christ's church, I want, I'm putting you under discipline. You are now suspended from the sacraments because I said so. No, I don't have that authority. Uh, that authority can only be exercised jointly by a church court, either by a session, either the session as a whole or a session through its commission, through a presbytery, presbytery as a whole, or presbytery through its commission, or through the General Assembly, General Assembly as a whole, or through its standing judicial commission. Um, now that, again, I think is really, really important for you to know that discipline is exercised not by a single man who might be biased against you, but collectively by elders who prayerfully consider the matter at hand and trying to apply scripture and the constitution of the church, the Westminster Standards and the Book of Church Order, to a given situation. But, but also to know that, that if they make a mistake, if they err, there are other bodies to which we can appeal because, because we're all connected together. We exercise our authority jointly. That's, that's the power of jurisdiction. So that distinction, the power of order and the power of jurisdiction, helps us understand the kinds of authority or power that church officers exercise. Now, who are the church officers in a Presbyterian church? Well, there are, there are two offices in particular. Uh, there is the office of elder, and there is the office of, of deacon. Now, the office of elder, we get that... We get the idea of elder from a number of places. You see it in Acts, uh, not just in Acts 6 as the apostles function as elders, but Acts 20 when Paul meets with the elders from Ephesus and greets them. You get that from Philippians 1 where both elders and deacons are mentioned. But, but preeminently uh, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, you see this pattern um, and description of elders. Our, our Book of Church Order talks about elders as those who exercise government and discipline and take oversight not only of the spiritual interests of the particular church, but also the church generally when called thereunto. Now, when I, when I teach our communicant kids, our, I try to get one word in their heads when it, so that they think elders, they're thinking one other word. And and that one word is overseers. When you think about elders, you're thinking about those who are overseers, those who exercise oversight. Um, 
I think it's significant that when Paul goes to describe the office of elder in 1 Timothy 3, he says if anyone desires to be an overseer, he desires a, a good work. That's what the office of elder is about. They exercise oversight. Now, we make a, a, a distinction in the office of elder in the PCA between teaching elders and ruling elders. And we get that distinction uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17, where Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, there you get both the idea of ruling or overseeing and those who are particularly set apart for the function of, of teaching. In other words, there are elders who rule who have as their primary function teaching. And that's why we call them teaching elders. Likewise, in 1 Timothy 3, when Paul goes to describe the, the office of elder, he says that elders are to be apt to teach. But it's clear from 1 Timothy 5, not all of them are exercising that aptness to teach as their main function. So, so teaching elders still rule, and ruling elders still need to be apt to teach. But they're still elders, all of them, teaching elders and ruling elders. It's a parody, we like to say, in the office of elder. Teaching elders are not more important or significant than ruling elders. Conversely, ruling elders are not more significant than teaching elders. Now, we, we share the office of elder together. Uh, and so I, I didn't become a, a preacher um, and then became an elder. No, I became an elder first. My ordination was to be a teaching elder. And so I'm an elder in Christ's church, just like our, our ruling elders are. And conversely, the Book of Church Order, when it talks about the el office of elder, it calls those elders, regardless of teaching or ruling elders, they calls them shepherds and pastors. So collectively, elders oversee, elders shepherd, elders pastor. But then there's a second office, and it's the office of, of deacon. And the word that most often gets associated with the word deacon is the word service. Um, they minister to those in need, to the sick, to the poor, to the distressed. Um, and that's from the very beginning in, in Acts chapter 6, where uh, I believe the first deacons were chosen. The word diakonos is used for the first time in relationship to these who sw serve the tables, who wait on the widows. What were they doing? They were, they were serving. Acts 6, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists rose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should give up the preaching of the word to serve the tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So, so these elders, the apostles, who were functioning as teaching elders particularly, they had responsibility for diaconal service. But instead of continuing to hold that responsibility, they delegated that responsibility to the deacons so that they might serve and free the elders to do shepherding and overseeing, preaching and teaching. We also believe that deacons uh, have a responsibility in regard to stewardship, uh, to develop the grace of liberality in the congregation. Uh, which makes sense, right? If they are serving tables, they need to be able to steward the funds necessary to supply the tables. So, but when you think about officers in a Presbyterian church, you're thinking about elders who oversee and deacons who serve. Now, those are the officers, but when they meet together, they meet together in church courts. Now, church court sounds very f formal, as though somebody's getting in trouble somewhere. But a court is just really a formal gathering 
whether it's a royal court or a justice court. Um, it's just a formal gathering where someone is presiding. And, and that's the idea when we talk about the church courts. There are three of them. There are sessions. There are presbyteries. And then uh, there is uh, a general gathering. We call it the general assembly. A session uh, is made up of the teaching and ruling elders of a local congregation who have been called by Christ through the election of the congregation to exercise oversight in that congregation. So it's, it's ruling elders, those who have been nominated and elected to serve on the session, but also teaching elders. So IPC, you elected me uh, as your pastor, and as part of electing me, you chose me to serve on the session. Ed Norton is an associate pastor. He's been elected by the congregation to serve on the session. So it's, it's teaching elders and ruling elders who are in a local congregation to exercise oversight in that congregation. Uh, so sometimes you'll hear people talk about the session. The session does this and the session does that. Well, here at IPC, the session's made up of about 28 men. Um, we just went to a rotation of six-year terms. Uh, so you serve for six years and then you rotate off uh, for two years and then you're eligible to come back if the congregation renominates you and reelects you. Uh, and so there's 28 men who represent you and care for you and shepherd you in our, in our various age and stage communities. That is the session. But, but we're not just a, a local, independent, autonomous, self-governing church. We are, we are Presbyterian, which means we are part of a presbytery. And a presbytery is a regional distinction. All the teaching elders and churches within its bounds that have been accepted by the presbytery. Um, and for us at IPC, we are part of Covenant Presbytery. So you're going to love my drawing here. This is Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, um, West Tennessee. Uh, and so Covenant Presbytery is made up of North Mississippi, West Tennessee, and Arkansas, except for Northwest Arkansas. They just left and became part of a different presbytery uh, that includes Oklahoma. Um, but this is our presbytery. We're, we're a presbytery of small churches. We have 46 churches in our presbytery, uh, and IPC is, is by far the largest of those churches, which means we have a significant responsibility to play in caring for the churches of our, of our presbytery. And we meet three times a year to, to oversee the work of the churches uh, in our local geographic area. Now, why do we do that? Why don't we just simply do, you know, go our own way and determine our own, our own events? Well, it's because the Bible, we believe, includes presbytery as one of those elements of church government. Right here in, in Acts chapter 15, you have this connectional idea. In, in Acts 15, you might remember, some men had come to First Presbyterian Church Antioch. Uh, and we're teaching uh, false doctrine. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved, they said. But it wasn't as though First Presbyterian Church Antioch said, all right, we're a, a self-governing, autonomous, independent church. We're going to solve this problem on our own. No. Um, Paul and Barnabas had dissension and debate with them, but then they said, nope, we're going to go to First Presbyterian Church Jerusalem and we're going to sort this whole thing out. And along the way, through uh, Phoenicia and Samaria, they stopped at other Presbyterian churches and collected some of those folks. And so when they got to Jerusalem, they either had the first Presbyterian meeting or the first General Assembly. And for those of us who've gone to Presbytery or General Assembly, it, it looks very familiar. Um, the issue is present, presented to the group, and then you have speeches. Um, Peter stands up. I recognize microphone number one, Apostle Peter, and he starts speaking. And then Paul and Barnabas stand up. I recognize microphone number three, and Barnabas and Paul start speaking. And then James, I recognize microphone seven, James starts speaking. And then collectively, the presbytery, the group, they make a decision, and they write a circular letter, a pastoral letter, that helps to guide all of the churches on the matter. 
Well, that's what presbyteries do. That's what, that's what our presbytery does. Which is why it's, I think, significant that we're part of this regional group caring for the 46 churches in our area. Of course, that's not all there is because there are other presbyteries. In the PCA, there's over 85 presbyteries right now. Um, and so we, we gather together once a year in the General Assembly. The General Assembly is the highest court of the church, which represents in one body all the churches of the denomination. And so General Assembly meets in different places. It met here in Memphis in 2007. This coming year in 2018, it's going to be in Atlanta. But it, it represents all the church, and we hear reports of what the whole church is doing through its agencies and committees as we continue to advance the cause of Jesus Christ around the world. Now, in order to understand why this connectionalism makes sense, there's a very, very helpful Presbyterian principle. In fact, I I would submit to you that if you could somehow get this, you would really get Presbyterianism in a nutshell. Um, My dad, when he was coming into PCA and he was nominated to be a ruling elder, he was handed a Book of Church order. Uh, at this point, they were on the West Coast, and they called it the BOCO, the B-O-C-O, the Book of Church order. And he kept saying to me, Sean, this, this BOCO, how do I make sense of it? What do I do with this? And I said, well, Dad, it's really simple. you just got to remember one sentence. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, you've got to remember the parts are in the whole, and the whole is in the parts. The parts are in the whole, And the whole is in the parts. If you get that sentence, you really get the connectional nature of the church. The parts, the individual churches and the regional presbyteries are in the whole, in the whole church. They are what make up the whole church collectively. But the whole, the authority of the PCA, uh, and really the sense of the PCA, is represented in each of the parts, the regional presbyteries and the local church. So there is a very real sense that when you go to your community and you go to a PCA church, that church represents the PCA, the whole church, to you. And and likewise, if a church struggles, it affects the whole church because the parts are in the whole and the whole is in the parts. Now, there are several kind of corollaries that that flow from that, uh, just to mention them briefly. One is that all the courts of the church are equal in power. Um, It's not as though a session, as they're dealing with a church discipline matter, it's not as though they say, well, this is above our pay grade. We we can't handle this. We need to kick this upstairs to the General Assembly. No. A session has authority given to it by Christ to declare doctrine, order its worship, and discipline its members. And so the session has authority, the authority of the whole church to discipline its members. In fact, if there is a discipline case and you have to write an indictment, um, it's, it's actually written in the name of the Presbyterian Church of, um, in America. So when we discipline members, we do so in the name of the whole church because the parts are in the whole and the whole is in the parts. Likewise, there's this principle of review and control so that what happens here at IPC in our session is actually reviewed by our presbytery. And so our minutes go to the presbytery and they check it not only for form, but also for substance. Did we violate the Constitution, the the Westminster Standards, the Book of Church Order? Did we do what we said we were going to do? Likewise, our presbytery's minutes are reviewed by the General Assembly. And if there's anything out of order, it's, it's brought to the floor of the General Assembly for discussion. That principle of review and control uh, makes sense because the parts are in the whole. And the whole has responsibility for the parts. Likewise, the parts have the right of appeal to the whole. So, so let's say that there is a session that is, that is acting wrongly, abusing authority, not doing things the way the Book of Church Order says they ought to be done. Well, a member of the session can complain against the action of session, and if the session denies the complaint, can appeal to the presbytery and say, hey, guys, Hey, other 46 churches in Covenant Presbytery, we, we need you to get involved in this because there's something bad wrong going on here. Uh, likewise, if something's going wrong in a presbytery, members of the presbytery can complain against the action of presbytery and then appeal to the General Assembly to get involved. Why does that make sense? Because the parts are in the whole 
and the whole is in the parts. And then finally, each part of the church has a responsibility to one another and to the whole. Um, it's not as though we can ignore th- what happens at the other PCA churches in Memphis. No, what happens at River Oaks or what happens at Redeemer, what happens at Grace Community affects us. And, and likewise, what happens here affects them. Um, we don't simply agree to disagree and go our own way. No, we, we ought to, at least in the uh, ideal world, we ought to do ministry together uh, as best we can because each part has a responsibility to the whole. If someone's been disciplined by our session and they go to another PCA church, that PCA church shouldn't just say, ah, eh, what happened over there at IPC? That doesn't matter. We'll take you in. No, they should because we have a responsibility to one another, they should call us and say, so-and-so has come here. Well, there's something we need to know. Um, there's something, something going on. Because we have a responsibility to each other, to care for one another. That's, that's part of what it looks like to be Christ's church. Now, for a lot of folks, they get impatient with this practice of church government. But this is the way that Jesus rules over his church. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. He is king over his church. It's Christ's crown, Christ's covenant. This is how the sovereignty of God applies to us as believers. We make promises when we join a Presbyterian church. One of them is, do you promise to submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to seek its purity and peace? And so as we live in the context of Christ's church, we don't say, well, you have no authority or you have all authority, but we do recognize that Christ has placed authority in his church with his elders to care for us, to shepherd us, and to get us home to, safe, home to heaven safely. Thanks be to God.